Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're here for the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, not necessarily the a part of the feast that is a separate holy day. And it's called the last the last great day. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter two and verse two and three. In chapter 2 it says, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains, and it will be raised above the hills. And all nations will stream to it. What's this mountain? What does he mean by that? Further in verse 3 it says, Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of, of, God, of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So that's the condition that we're going to find in, in the last days. Now it speaks of this in Daniel chapter 2. So it starts here, and it breaks into the narrative. Daniel went to Arioch. Now Arioch was appointed by the king to execute all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Daniel was also on that list. So were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were the, uh, the Babylonian names that were given to Daniel's three companions when he were first discovered by Nebuchadnezzar. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. So Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. So the king asked Daniel, who was also called Belteshazzar, which was his Babylonian name, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied to him, Most in the spirit that comes from the Almighty which doesn't claim anything for the self. And Daniel, in line with that spirit, says, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about. And again, what we've seen with Stephen, and with Daniel, and with Job, and with all of these men of God, the man got out of the way to reveal the God behind him. And Daniel said, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. And your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. Now he went on to tell the king that he was that head of gold. He went on to tell the king that there would be another kingdom after him, inferior in value to his, to that head of gold. And then he went on down to tell him, and we'll pick it up here uh, in verse 36. He said, this was the dream and now we will interpret it to the king, in verse 36 of Daniel 2. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. And in your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold of this image that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamt. And that now God Almighty was revealing the interpretation to. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. And next, the third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom. And now he goes into more explanation than at any other time about this fourth kingdom. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks to pe things to pieces, so it will crush and break all of the others, so it will be exceedingly different and exceedingly stronger, by far. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron on the image, so this will be a divided kingdom. Now we understand through the course of history, because we're lucky to live in the days that we do, that we understand the Babylonian kingdom, we understand that what came after the Babylonian kingdom was the Medo-Persian kingdom, we understand what came after 
that kingdom in a world ruling sense with the Greco-Macedonian Empire. And then after them came Rome and the Roman Empire, which lasted for a long time and exceedingly stronger than any of the empires that fell before because of its military might and because of its strength. And the chronology of that empire lasted, outlasted any of the others. But now we see something that describes this Romanish system and this Romanish power as being made of iron and clay, the ten toes, on this whole image, this huge image that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed. So, anyway, finally there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks to pieces, so it will crush and break all of the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this kingdom, and we believe that's a future event, we know it's a future event. So that this will be a divided kingdom, and yet it will have some of the strength of the iron in it that we had seen before. Even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay in verse 42, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle, fracturous. And just as you saw the iron mixed with the baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than the iron mixes with clay. So we can clearly see now that there is, uh, there is an Achilles heel to this kingdom that has iron in it, but we also could see that it's fracturous. We also could see that it has a very short chronological period of time. It will not stay together, just as iron and clay cannot mix together. Now here's my point uh, in addressing Isaiah 2. In the time of those kings, right? Don't forget what Isaiah verse... 2 said of chapter 2, right? It always refers to in that day or in the last days. So it gives you the exact time that he's talking about. Here it says it again. In the time of those kings, right? The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. And it will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock that was cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. And the king knew that, because his challenge to these magicians was, you tell me what I dreamt, and then you interpret what I dreamt. And the magicians kept trying to tell him over and over again, tell us what you dream and then we'll interpret it. How could we know what you dreamt? But Nebuchadnezzar wanted an answer. And he wanted an answer that could only be produced supernaturally. He got his answer. God Almighty answered him. And in the course of doing so, told him that this supernatural rock that was cut out of the mountain, that would smash that image, right, and break it to pieces, that that supernatural rock's kingdom would grow into a large mountain that would cover the whole earth. And that that kingdom would have no end. All of these other kingdoms, would be their end would be brought about as a result of this supernatural stone. So. And then Isaiah 12. Like I said, we'll be flipping back and forth quite often through to Isaiah. Verse 1, in that day you will say, I will, in that day, again, it's describing something here, in the last days, you know, in that day, you will say, I will praise you, O Lord, although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. And here's something very beautiful. Surely God is my salvation and I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. So already in Isaiah, they were talking about this redemption that would be coming through the seed of Abraham, the salvation, saving, and by whom and through whom the whole world would be blessed. And then in uh, verse uh, 3 of chapter 12, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, and make known among the nations what he has done, 
and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. And let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Wow. Wow. And those very words will be spoken again. Those very words will be said by a multitude of people. And they'll be said at a time when all of this is done. Yeah. Isaiah 55. Speaking of this uh, drawing from the well of salvation, speaking from this very thing. And you'll find that there is a correlation to what I'm reading and to the very sermon that Christ gave on the last great day of the feast that we're going to be reading later on. There's a correlation of that to that. You wait and see. Now Isaiah 55 verse 1. It says, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money. In other words, you can't buy this. It doesn't matter what you have. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without any cost to you. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? So already curiosities are starting to come to the front of our mind and we start wondering, well, what's he talking about? And then he has an admission, uh, 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 admonishing you to listen. And he says it twice. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. So obviously he's talking about something that we need to consume or that needs to consume us. And your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. So he's saying, depending on what you're hearing and that, and that perceiving of what he's saying can save you. It can give you real life. And then he's holding out his hand here with love and he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David in the same way. So in the same way when we're reading Psalms and we're marveling at the kind of relationship that David had with his God. God is saying right here in the beginning, come all you who are thirsty. Are you thirsty all the time? No. Nope. Thirst hits you at certain periods. And that's when you look to be satisfied. And that's what he's basically saying. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Right? Surely you will summon nations, and you will know not that, uh, that you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you. <coughs> and we're starting to experience experiencing some of that right now in a small way. And who knows where that's going to go? Who knows how that's going to grow? And they're from a distant nation and they don't know us. We don't know them. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor for free, just for the asking. And he's pleaded with you to take it from his hand. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. And that's a very, very popular scripture that we hear over and over again, but it's taken out of a very magnificent setting. That scripture's taken out of this whole setting here. And that's where that scripture belongs, in this setting. Yeah. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon anybody. As long as you turn to him. 
And then he goes on again. This is another scripture that's been extracted from Isaiah 55 over and over again. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways, neither are your ways, my ways. Again, it's taken out of a very magnificent setting. This all belongs together. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the shower and bread for the eater. And here again, another thing that has been extracted from this text. So it is, my word, that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Again, this word is a word that moves things. It reveals things. It sustains things and it empowers. These are words of life. And they are living words. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign, which will not be destroyed. That is the context of this. And it starts with an invitation to the thirsty, with an invitation to those who long for their God, who an invitation for those who desire to know him and to be forgiven and who are willingly ready to worship him from their heart. And that's why King David is mentioned in there. And, and not only that, those Pharisees, or rather those Sadducees that didn't believe in life after death, this is Isaiah here talking after King David's death, stating exactly what would happen. Right? He's saying here in part of verse 3, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. And then it says in verse 4, See, I have made him a witness to the peoples. Not only a witness to the peoples when he was a physical king, but the words that he left behind, that were inspired by the Holy Spirit that was in him, those words are a witness to the peoples. And they edify us, even to this day, because they are living words. I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Period. And this was after David's death. He was dead. So the Sadducees should have read that. They would have understand, understood at that point that not only was David used as an instrument to preserve words that would bring judgment and that would bring edification, but that his life and whoever he was, his own individual personality type, would be preserved in God for a future date when God would again raise him up. And even David's own words say that when he talks about how he will be quickened. And how he will rise and awaken to his reward. And that how God will long to see him again. And to hear his songs and his voice. And to commune with such a personality. Who had the heart to pursue him. Unbiasedly and wholeheartedly. You have the same invitation. And he's inviting you without any cost. And he is putting King David right in the middle of this text. In the same text that he's using. To call you forward very gently, telling you that he'll forgive you, and telling you that he'll sustain you forever. This is a big deal. That's very huge. I want to go to John 4. John chapter 4. We have a lot to get through today here. John chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Makes you wonder, like, why was he baptizing? But baptizing they were. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who, was ba uh, who, was, uh, who baptized, but his disciples. So then the Lord learned of this. He left Judea and he went, he went back once more to Galilee. 
Now he had to go through Samaria on the way to Galilee. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sachar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Wow, we just read about that. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour of the day. That's very noteworthy. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy some food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I, and I am a Samaritan woman. So it's not only enough that you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, but you're a male Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman and you're actually talking to me and asking me for a drink. And then, of course, the Bible says there, how can you ask me for a drink? And then in, uh, in brackets it has, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans, meaning they don't touch them, they don't talk to them, they don't even acknowledge them. As a matter of fact, they avoid their towns, their cities, for that reason, at all costs. Because they looked at them as less than. And they looked at the fact that if they touched them or communed with them in any way, these goyim, they would be defiled. And they wouldn't be able to go to the temple. And that's what was drummed into their heads since they were little kids. Now here's a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman, asking her for, for her to draw him a drink. Very strange. Very strange. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for this drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. But he knew what he was doing. He started this. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw the water with, and the well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you even greater than our father, for our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Are you greater than him? Everyone, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw the water. <laughs> she didn't understand. And we stop right there in Isaiah 44. Remember what she said. <clears throat> Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw, and the well is deep. And she asked him, Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? She's calling Jacob her father. Okay? All right. So we go to Isaiah 44. Why was she able to say that? And why were the Jews at that point able to hold these people in so much contempt? And yet Jesus Christ was sitting down with this woman talking to her. And not only talking to her, but asking her to draw him a drink. Now in Isaiah 44, it says here in verse 1, But now listen, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says, He who made you and who formed you in the womb, and who will help you, do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. And I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendant. <clears throat> What's he talking about here? I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, Jacob, and my blessing on your descendants. And now Jesus Christ is talking to what the average Jews of his day wouldn't even spend a second acknowledging to a woman asking her to draw him some water. And then he tells her that if she knew to whom he, she was speaking, he would give her living waters. This descendant of Jacob. 
And in verse 4, they will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. And one will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call him by the, himself by the name of Jacob, which he was doing. Are you greater than our forefather Jacob? One will call himself by the name of Jacob, and still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will take the name Israel. Don't forget what it says in verse 3. For I will pour water on a thirsty land, a land that's parched. What water is he talking about? And streams of this water on the dry ground. Imagine the first raindrops of the wet season hitting the dry ground and how they congeal and how they run down as if the land was just anticipating and parched for it. I will pour out, pour out, my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And now we go back to when he was talking to this woman. And now we read verse 11, when she said to him, sorry, verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And even there is a mystery that we still don't understand completely. Because it is a part of what we need to experience as Christians. The welling up part is only the part that we are in the process of trying to attain at this moment. But we do have a promise. And we do look and we do see this promise from a distance. Not clear and not up close. But this is the journey that we're taking to find and to realize these promises. This woman was about to receive this promise. So he told her, go call your husband and come back. Jesus said to her, and she said, I have no husband, she replied. And then Christ went on to tell her, that you're right. You don't have a husband. In fact, you have had five husbands, and the man that you now have is not your husband. You're not even married. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. So right away, she knew something was very different here. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And then Jesus straightened her out. He said, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. He wasn't saying that they don't worship and they don't have understanding, but they don't quite see it as completely as they should. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. And yet a time is coming and has now come. He spoke that way a lot. A time is coming and now has and has now come to this duality. Who could say? But he could have used many other phrases and many other ways of speaking this, but he didn't. There was a duality here. Yet a time is coming. And we can read that in these prophecies when it says the last days at that time. And has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit. And so his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And then the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared to her, I who speak to you. To you and he. Wow. Wow. And just then his disciples returned and they were surprised to see him talking with a woman. Now they stayed there for several days. What were they doing while they were staying there? Did they baptize these people? Did that woman receive this living water? Because Jesus' disciples were baptizing 
And it was saying in the beginning of this narrative that they were baptizing now more disciples than John in water. Okay, why were they doing that? What was Christ initiating this conversation with this woman? Well, what did it produce? It produced an understanding in her that the very one who was telling her these things, for whatever reasons, that he was telling her to serve a purpose. What came of it? Well, they stayed there for several days. You could see it right here. That they believed. That there was many believers that were added to their number. And that they were encouraged. And that they didn't just believe because of what the woman said. They believed because of what they personally now heard right from Christ's own mouth. <clears throat> and many were added to their number that day. How were they added? They raised their hand and said, okay, pick me up. Yeah, okay, yeah, we got your name here. No, they were added because they chose to be baptized. And when it was time for Christ to send down the Holy Spirit, that Spirit was sent. And on anyone whose heart was right and who was chosen, that Spirit came and it landed. And it came on them and they received living water. And that spring of living water that was planted in them is supposed to well up in them unto eternal life. As a matter of fact, the Samaritans received the gospel long before his own people did. Jesus Christ tried, and they wouldn't receive it. The Samaritans received it with joy. Imagine that. In John chapter 7, I want to draw your attention here to something. John chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposefully staying away from Judea because the Jews were waiting to take his life. Can you read that? Do you understand that? After this, what was the after this? Well, after this was when Christ had told them that he was the bread of life that the Father had sent down from heaven and that this bread was the flesh that gives life to the world and that they must partake of this flesh, and they will live forever. Christ told them to stop grumbling among themselves, and went on to explain that no one could come to him unless the Father who sent him from heaven draws them, and then he will raise them up on the last day. And Christ knew, just like he knew when he was talking to that Samaritan woman, he knew the effect of his words. I'll prove that. You'll see right away here. Let's go to John chapter 6. It's just back here from chapter 7. <clears throat> so we read that after this. Well, what was the after this? Something had changed here. And the result of that changing had caused Christ to hang around in Galilee and to not go into Judea. And it's very clearly expressed that if he went into Judea, they were looking to kill him. They were looking to get him. And we'll begin in uh, chapter 20, uh, sorry, verse, chapter 6, verse 25. When they found him, this was after uh, Christ had fed the multiple thousands, and he even walked on water. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You were looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill, your belly was full. Do not work for food that spoils. You're going to be hungry in a few hours, but for food that endures to eternal life. So he was taking what was motivating them at this moment and he was reflecting the true cause. The same thing he did with the Samaritan woman. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, What must we do? What must we do to do the to do the works that God requires? Remember we used to hear all the time? We got to get to be doing the work. There's a work to be done. And people would throw their money at doing the work. Throw some money. Let's do the work. They asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? 
Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. That's it. Very plain. Very simple. If you need a starting point, that's where you start. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then would you give me give that we may see it and believe you? Now that's pure satanic motivation from a spirit that had nothing to do with Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. In verse 30. So they asked him after he said this to them. What miraculous sign then will, will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Right? If you go and you look into the fact that they always ask for a sign, that it's right from the devil himself. That's the two things they ask. Well, who are you? Who do you think you are? Some kind of prophet? Some kind of messenger? Some kind of guy? Show us a sign. Well, in Matthew 4, verse 3 and verse 6, it talks about Satan tempting Jesus Christ. Don't turn there. I'll turn there quickly because it's important. This is the same spirit. Oh yeah, and that same spirit is alive and well today, causing its division, causing its trouble, always being a provocateur, always wanting proof. Matthew 4, verse 3. The tempter came to him and it said, If you are the Son of God, well, tell these stones to become bread. Show me a sign. And then he says here in verse 6, right? If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. And that's what the Pharisees asked for. The same thing. Show us a sign so that we may believe. And Jesus Christ told them, believe on the miracles themselves. And they testify that I came from the Father. And I don't need anyone else as a witness, just Him. I don't come on my own behalf. I don't speak the things that are coming from my own mind. Only what the Father has given me to say. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, and none will be given to it. And now, after they ask that, now that you have the comparisons. What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? Well, why are they following him to the other side? Christ clearly told them why. It's not because you saw me do miracles. He confirmed what they saw right in the beginning. They found him on the other side of the lake and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered him in verse 26, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Period. Read it. Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, verse 31. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And now Jesus Christ chose to say exactly what he's about to say. And he knows how it's going to resonate. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, for the, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Okay, now he's starting to bring them into a conversation and he knows where this is going to land. And you'll see that. Sir, they asked, from now on, give us some of this bread. The same thing that the, that the Samaritan woman asked. Well, give me some of this water. Then I won't have to keep coming back here. They said the same thing. Well, give us some of this bread. Yeah, you're right. We were asking and looking for you, not because of the miracles, but because our bellies were full. Give us some of this bread so we'll never hunger again. Then Jesus declared, and this was the beginning, right? I am the bread of life. He who comes down, he who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me which we are supposed to do, will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. 
You've seen these miracles, and they're not enough to, to allow you to believe. And he knew that because they saw the miracles, and they didn't even believe after that point, they were only there to get their bellies full, to satisfy their physical needs. And then they were coming to Christ and asking him for a sign right after that. And then they were trying to lord it over and talk about their past, and talk about how God fed their ancestors personally in the desert. What they're leaving out is that he also, God also vowed that not one of their ancestors would see his promise, and that each one of their corpses lay in the desert, even to that day. And that was after they filled their bellies with this manna. <laughs> Christ is saying, I'm not talking about manna, I'm talking about never hungering again, or thirsting again. But as I told you, you have seen me, basically, and you've seen the miracles, and still you do not believe. So there's nothing more that can be done for you. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And now he's making the distinction. He's separating the sheep and the goats right now with his own mouth. And he's using their own behavior and what they exemplify themselves by asking for a sign, even though they've seen the miracles. He's using their own behavior to distinguish between the two of them. And what's about to happen now is they're not going to be able to accept what he's saying. You see, like the rich man that came to him and said, what am I lacking? I've done all this stuff. And Jesus said to him, well, yeah, but you've got you to do that. And the rich guy says, oh my God, I can't do that. And Jesus said, well, there's your answer. You can't do what needs to be done. All that the Father gives me will come to me. So now he's saying something to them. And whoever comes to me, as a result of the Father giving him to him, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall not lose none of all that he has given me. So there's a selection here. And there's a numbering here. There is a all of what the Father has given him. There is a summation. It's a total. None of all that the Father has given me, but I will raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and who believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And Christ knew how that would resonate. They said, Is this not Jesus? The son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How can he now say, I come down from heaven? What's he talking about? And Christ knew how it would resonate. The same way that it resonates today. The same Jews, same attitude, same signs. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's very powerful. And I will raise him up at the last day. Imagine that. That's the second time now he said, and I will raise him up at the last day. What's the last day? What last day? Think about it. It is written in the prophets that they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Who forefathers ate the manna in the desert, and yet they died, just like I said. God Almighty said, not one of them will enter into my promise, because they have spurned me and they have spat on my face, and every one of their corpses will lie in the desert. But here, in verse 50, is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now that was a bombshell. He just dropped a bombshell on them. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat?
Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up. Here it is again, emphasized in the narrative. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Yes, your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. And he said this while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Now on hearing this, many of his disciples said, many, this is a hard teaching. Who could accept this? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, to them, Does this offend you? That if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before, the Spirit gives life, and the flesh counts for nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit. They are spiritual words. And they are life. And yet there are some of you who do not believe. And then it says something very interesting here. For Jesus had known right from the beginning which of them did not believe. And he even knew who would betray him. And he went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So there is an unlocking of our mind. And however that is fashioned upon us, it still arrives supernaturally on us. And there is an unlocking and a want to follow God. And that unlocking of our mind leads to an unlocking of our heart. And it allows the Almighty to mold us, and to shape us, and to fashion us. Once we start to allow this to happen, we are partaking of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ followed the same process. He did the same thing. He didn't do anything of his own accord and of his own will. He did everything the Father had given him to do. He didn't do anything on his own. And we are told the same thing. And you could read it with the disciples. How they relinquished their own individuality when it came to where their feet were planted. And what message that they were bringing. And the things that they suffered. And the things that they had to leave behind. We call Christ a man of many sorrows. Part of what formed his sorrow, we're going to read about in a couple minutes here. Because it was very sorrowful for him. And he could have choose, chosen to say anything. He could have chosen to say things that were convincing to them. He did. We're going to read about it in a second. He knew how. Like Stephen, he didn't bring in witnesses. He didn't bring in arguments to defend himself and to sustain himself. He didn't open up the New Testament and say, here's all the prophecies about me. What are you going to do with that? I am from the line of David. I was my mother and father both. I was born in Bethlehem. I came from Galilee. And if you morons knew and were able to look up the scriptures the way that you should, you would understand that Galilee by the sea was a blessed way to come. And that that very same way that was taken by the Assyrian army to capture the northern kingdom, that brought shame on this nation, it was the very same way that the Israelites left the land. It was the very same way that would be blessed at this point. And we're going to read that in Isaiah 9. That's the words of God, not my words. But I'm also not going to shy away and shrink away from those words. You read them for yourself and you'll understand. You know what? Those are very powerful things. Jesus Christ decided not to stick up for himself. Jesus Christ decided to tell the truth. And to give us a spiritual insightfulness that really could only be understood by those whose minds are unlocked by God, not by ourselves. And they can only be unlocked by God. They can't be unlocked by us. So he said something that was very hard and many disciples were leaving him. And he went on to tell them, this is why I told you, in verse, verse 65 of chapter 6, this is why I told you that no one could come to me Unless the Father has enabled him, there's a rite of passage here. It's not up to me, it's up to the Almighty. From this time, many of his disciples turned back, and they no longer followed him. 
You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve, because everyone was leaving and turning their back on him. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus Christ knew right from the beginning who wouldn't get it. Jesus Christ knew right from the beginning who was even going to betray him. Right here it says, Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. And he met Judas, the son of Simon, Iscariot, who, although one of the twelve, very intimate, was later to betray him. <coughs> very shocking. So we began to read that after this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposefully staying away from Judea because of the Jews. They were there waiting to take his life. But then the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near. Jesus' brothers said to him, his own brothers, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles that you do, fella. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. What are you doing? Since you are doing these things, why don't you show yourself to the world? And then it says here, and this supports exactly the way I'm reading it, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. And Jesus got the point. Because of what happened here in chapter 6, a lot of retribution came on Jesus' family. And Jesus was front and center and not in a very good way, in a very distasteful way by the whole nation, or at least by the leaders of that nation, by enough people that brought that pressure to bear. And now the tide was going to turn to where it would allow and precipitate the death of Jesus Christ only so many months later at the Passover. Therefore Jesus told them, the time for me has not yet come. So he knew. And then Christ said to him, for you any time is right. For you any time is right for what? The feast? Combing your hair? No. For you, any time is right for me to disappear. Because that's what he was addressing. The time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right to have done what you expect to be done. You know the Jews are looking to kill me. And you're telling me to go down to, Judea, to Jerusalem, to, through to uh, Judea. Wow. The world cannot hate you. And remember that. The world cannot hate you. But it hates me, because I testify that what it does is evil. And that's what happens with us. When we decide to align ourselves with the Holy Spirit and allow us to change us inside, and if for some reason the Almighty separates us to be able to deliver a testimony against wicked things and against men that know better, whose teaching have now become futile, who have become frustrated and they still won't confront the very root and cause of that frustration and that ineffectiveness when they speak. They still don't choose to rend their hearts to the Almighty. And the Almighty can see their hearts. And he knows. He knows. But as soon as we stand up and we testify, we stand up against that spirit that wants to divide, all hell breaks loose. There's war in our lives, there's war in our churches, there's war everywhere. We turn. Because those that worship another master, those that are bought and sold by him, will be combative to us. Like Christ said, the world cannot hate you, my brothers, but it hates me. And the reason why it hates him, he says with his own words, because I testify that what it does is evil. I speak contrary to it. I expose it. I shine a light on it. And then it hates as a result. And it murders. You can see that. I am not going to this feast because for me the time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but he went in secret. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him. And they were asking, where is that man? Where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, well, he's a good man. Others replied, no, no, he deceives people. 
but no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews because of the miracles, because they couldn't argue with that. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and they asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. And if anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does, not, does so to gain honor for himself. And there are so many teachers, so-called teachers, doing that today. And they don't realize in whose sight they're doing it. He's watching. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? And yet, not one of you who keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? He was confronting his spirit again. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. You are demon possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you are all astonished. And yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcised a child on the Sabbath. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? In other words, if the eighth day after a child's birth just happens and lands on a Sabbath, you're still going to circumcise him. So if they lower a paralytic to me, and he's gagging, and he's in trouble, and he's in pain, and I see him in pain, and my heart is moved to heal him on the Sabbath day, you tell me that's wrong. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man that they're trying to kill? <clears throat> so they knew. They just finished asking him, are you demon possessed? Who's trying to kill you? What the heck are you talking about? And now they're saying, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man that they're trying to kill? Here he is, speaking publicly. And they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? And that was the other part of the pressure that not a lot of people know, is that the authorities had to make a decision. Because there was so much controversy, some were saying he's deceitful, he's deceiving the people. Some were saying, no, he's a prophet. Nobody can do the things he did, does without the hand of God upon him. And the teaching he has, they marveled at his teaching. You could, we just read it. And that's when he used that introduction to get out of the way and to reveal the Father. He said, I'm not teaching what I want. I'm doing what I'm instructed by the Father. At that point, they began to say things. But we know where this man is from. Again, they wouldn't believe. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. They, they're just talking rudely and ignorantly, and they still do to this day. They don't know what the scriptures say. The scriptures clearly point to how the Christ will come. So they don't know their own scriptures. They're saying, well, nobody will know where he's from or who, where he comes from or anything else. That, what a load of baloney. You'll see it a couple times here. Even their teachers were full of crap. They didn't know. They should have known. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask these questions. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, he cried out. Yes, you know me. And you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. This was supernaturally stopped. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him, and they said, When the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Again, the pressure was on. 
And then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Okay, that's enough. We're getting him now. So they sent them out. And Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time. And then I will go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go? That he cannot find people, that he cannot find him. Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. In verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the feast, which is where we find ourselves, Jesus stood, and in a loud voice he said, If anyone is thirsty, then let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. We just read this before. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing these words, some of the people said, Surely this man is, is the prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. And still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does, does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Sure it does, but they didn't know their own scriptures. Just as much today, they're just as ignorant. They don't know. Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because it wasn't his time. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? We sent you out to get him. No one ever spoke the way that this man does, the guards declared. You mean that he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? Now the public pressure was starting to mount on anyone that would publicly uh, say that they believed in him. No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them, on the guards that went out. Now here's something funny. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, at night, and spoken Aramaic with him, and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing, hearing him to find out what he is doing? Right? So Nicodemus had a great point. Does our law not afford any kind of justice, even to a man who would come under this type of suspicion, where he would send soldiers out to gab him, but yet we don't even have a chance to hear what he has to say? In response to this, they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find out that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. And sure enough, these idiots in Isaiah 9, all they had to do was turn to a book that they probably could recite from beginning to end, that's what they did. And they spoke so sharply, and they shut this guy up when he tried to remind them of their own uh, open social values when it came to having someone representing themselves, or at least answering them a charge. They wouldn't even allow that. And then it says here, in chapter 9, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali. And that's what I was telling you, that the Assyrians used that as a route to come into Israel, smash them down, and then displace them and take them out by that way. And no longer the Israelites inhabited that land, but it was inhabited by the Samaritans, by these dark, swarthy people. Uh, and also, you know, Galilee was known as the, as the land of the Gentiles, right here. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. And then right there, he goes in to talk about the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Right? And this whole messianic prophecy begins right from this point that he would honor 
Galilee of the Gentiles. And yet these learned men who are supposed to know these scriptures, especially these messianic scriptures, are saying, There's, uh, you'll find out that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Well, here, clearly here in Isaiah, they're talking about the prophet, the one coming out of Galilee. And then it goes on to speak of this messianic prophecy. So why wouldn't Jesus defend himself? Well, he was fulfilling scripture. The Messiah would be forsaken and pierced. And that was in Psalm 22. The Messiah would be the righteous sufferer. You'll find that in Psalm 69. He could have used many scriptures. A few of them are that he would be born in Bethlehem, which he was. They had to go back for the census. His family name showed where he was from and where he was born. Micah 5, chapter 5, verse 2 expresses that. The Messiah would be born of a virgin. That's in Isaiah 7, 14. And the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. And that he would be from Galilee. Isaiah 9, verse 1 to 2. We just read it. Now in Luke 24, I'm trying to mosey along here. Luke 24. Now this is after the death of Christ. Two of his disciples were walking up the road. He walks up and he joins them. But he does not permit them to recognize him. By whatever supernatural means, they don't know that it's him. And they're talking with him as they're walking about up on the road. And they're saying, hey, you haven't heard what happened in Jerusalem? You didn't know what was going on? So, in verse 24 of chapter 24 in Luke, it said that some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. So the women went to the tomb, it was emptied, and then the angel spoke to them. And then the men went to confirm it. But him they did not see, which is Jesus. So in verse 25 he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart. Really? to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, which he could have done before. Instead, he spoke to them about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He spoke to them in spiritual words that he knew they wouldn't get. And he knew that it would ramp up their opposition against him. But he spoke those words for us. He spoke those words for generations that would come after and believe in him. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Hey, stay with us, for it's nearly evening time. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them, right, piece at a time. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he, and he disappeared from their sight, right there when they recognized him. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us, while he talked with us on the road, and he opened the scriptures to us? I had a lot more to go through, but obviously I have run out of time. But I will close with Daniel 4. I will close with the words of a Gentile king. He wasn't even the king of Israel. He was the one who took Judah captive, and he was the one who completely destroyed Jerusalem. And this is his words. This is his testimony in Daniel 4. Daniel 4. And verse 34. Now Nebuchadnezzar, one morning, was looking out over the city. And he was being vain, very vain with himself, but he was thinking, you know what? Look at all that I have my hands have done. 
So God made him wild like an animal for a, a period of years. And at the end, in verse 34, of that time, when he has been driven wild like an animal, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is his own writing, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures forever from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and with the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Thank you.